Thank you for joining us for a presentation from Quoted Data's Round the World webinar series, American Session. I'm joined by Victor Sabo and Mubi Kwaja, members of the investment team responsible for managing Aberdeen Latin American Income Fund. I'll pass over to Victor and Mubi to take you through the fund. So thank you, David. Let's start with the fund's objective, which is to provide capital growth and to pay a steady stream of dividends to shareholders through investing in Latin American equities and fixed income instruments. So Latin America, when we speak about it, 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 it is a large and quite vibrant continent combining many countries. We invest in seven of those, and you can see them on the slide, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, Argentina. These are the, these countries have the deepest markets and they are the most interesting for us as investors. These countries also combine a population of over 500 million, uh, which exceeds that of the entire European Union. And it is also a relatively young continent in terms of the population's age. The average age would be around 32 years, which is um, 12 years younger than that of the European Union. So it's quite a young and, and, and vibrant uh, bunch of countries. Uh, if we can move over. So one of the main objectives of the fund, as I have mentioned, is to pay dividends. We do it on a quarterly basis. And if we look at the prices at the end of January, the net dividend yield of the fund is around 7%. If we can move to the next slide, you will see that um, this region has experienced some difficult moments, especially in 2021. Uh, the previous slide, please. So as you can see, the region has experienced some difficult moments, especially in 2021. We had a combination of multiple factors, uh, the pandemic, uh, the still strong U.S. equity markets, which continue to suck capital away from, from emerging markets and from other markets uh, of the world. So the, this region was really out of love. Uh, fortunately, that is starting to change, uh, change. We have seen much better performance from regional assets. Uh, recovery has started for the economy as well and for the markets. We are seeing the support of commodities prices and uh, especially on the equity side, um, we had some more positive months. We can go to the next slide. As you can see, currently the composition of the funds uh, is 64% equities and 36% debt. Um, the equities part is obviously responsible for delivering the capital gains and the fixed income part is mostly responsible for providing the income for the fund. Uh, we have 14% uh, gross leverage uh, on the fund. In terms of the geographic breakdown, uh, you see the largest part of the investments are in Brazil and Mexico, which would be not surprising given that these are the, the deepest uh, capital markets uh, in the region with, with, with a larger selection of stocks, but also on the fixed income side, these are the most liquid government bond markets. And with that, I'll pass to Mubi. Thank you, Victor. So Victor's talked about um, why Latin America by showing you the, um, the population chart and has talked a little bit about our fund. I would like to start with talking about why Latin America now. And if we can move on to the next slide, I think the point that is first worth highlighting is what Victor alluded to, that last year was a very tough year for emerging markets in general and Latin America in particular. And this means that if we look at valuations now, Latin America is a value play. So valuations are particularly cheap uh, compared to historical averages for the region itself and certainly in comparison with other parts of the world, uh, which allow um, a, way, a, a cheap 
entry into um, buying Latin American assets, Latin American companies, especially at a point in time when they are recovering from COVID and can possibly see earnings growth uh, in the next couple of quarters and certainly years to come. So this in itself is a very attractive uh, reason to look at the region now. If we come, come to the technicals that also Victor alluded to, last year we saw uh, outflows from the region because local asset managers were struggling and they were uh, facing outflows, particularly in Brazil and Chile. And this trend has also started to reverse. So we have seen some inflows into the region already, which is very encouraging and which will be positive for the, for the equity markets in the region. If we move on to the next slide, I want to show you that um, dividend is a key part of the total return that has been experienced by Latin American investors. As you can see on this chart, it has a role to play in most markets. But if you look at the local currency returns over the last 20 years for Latin American market, then it is responsible for more than half of the return uh, of that thousand uh, percent, that outsized return that Latin um, American investors have experienced. And there are reasons for why uh, Latin American companies prefer to pay a dividend rather than to share buybacks or the like, uh, which are quite deep rooted and unlikely to change anytime uh, in soon. So moving on then to um, our fund again, if we go to the next slide, I would like to highlight a couple of themes that we invest in. And perhaps let me tie that with the company examples that I have on the next slide and take you straight away there. So the first theme is of aspiration. And what does it mean? It basically means, um, goes back to the point about young population, rising middle class, uh, and it's all about uh, consumption. So people um, are earning more. They are also demanding better products and services. And this is where aspiration theme comes into play. So this would include companies such as healthcare companies, uh, like the first example here, Notre Dame Intermedica. It's a vertically integrated healthcare provider in Brazil. This company uh, very recently, like literally two days ago, saw no name change because it has completed its merger with Hapida. So now it is called Hapida, but this is one of the companies that we own in our portfolio. Another interesting example is a shoe retailer that some of you might have heard of if you have visited Brazil, Redso. Um, very popular again, again, one of uh, the consumer names that we own in the fund uh, for, for a long time now. The second theme is of infrastructure plays. Now, Latin America is a region which has an infrastructure gap, which means that companies which are providing infrastructure services, like for instance, OMA in Mexico, the airport operator, have very attractive returns and, uh, and substantial growth opportunities. So again, this is a theme that we like to have exposure to within the fund. Digital future. Now this theme is quite broad. And the reason why it is so interesting for the region is that digitalization penetration is very low in Latin America, but adoption of, of digital channels is quite high. If you look at social uh, media adoption or internet penetration. Uh, this means that there are huge opportunities for online um, plays such as e-commerce companies, uh, which the first example is of Soma Cardo Libre. We own that in the fund. And then we also own companies which help other companies digitalize, such as Globant, which is a digital consultancy. It helps uh, other businesses um, you know, fulfill their digitalization goals and provides them with the software and all the technology that they need. So various ways to come towards the same uh, theme and have exposure to the same kind of growth. Going green, this is a theme which is, um, you know, very topical, uh, again, a global theme, but I would say more relevant uh, even in Latin America because um, Latin America, as you know, has a high exposure to commodities. And, um, this means that there are opportunities to invest not only in just the farm operators, the renewable farm operators, wind or solar operators, but also in the value chain. So companies like WEG, the first example here is an equipment maker. They provide equipment to the farms. Um, and then companies like Ryazan, which actually is one of the largest uh, sugar and ethanol producers globally. So a number of ways to have exposure to this clean energy team uh, and especially in the form of commodity plays as well, present themselves in Latin America, um, allowing for a diversified um, you know, approach towards uh, having exposure to going green. 
the fifth is called tech enablers. And uh, this is again uh, related with uh, digitalization and it means um, companies which are allowing other companies to um, have access to digital uh, platforms uh, or enabling them to have digital platforms. So Arco, for example, is one of those companies which provides digital software to uh, schools. So it's an education company and it allows uh, schools to offer online teaching. This was very much welcomed by parents during the homeschooling that many of us uh, faced during uh, lock various lockdowns in our countries. And this company operates in Brazil. So it was offering this facility to parents in Brazil, which I'm sure was much welcomed at the time. The second uh, company is Totwist. This provides ERP software and it's mainly in the serving SME customers. Again, a dominant player in the market, uh, a long time holding for us. And then financial services. Financial services, as you would typically expect, include banks, uh, the stock exchange itself. So a number of ways that we have exposure to this team in uh, most of our markets. We own a bank in Mexico, in Brazil, in Colombia, uh, in, in Peru. So this is uh, quite a diverse theme for us as well. Now I would like to take you to the next slide, which shows uh, us about uh, the, what the fund looks like in terms of valuations. Now, one thing which, is, uh, which I must highlight at this point is that we like exposure to these themes, but only through very high quality companies. So when I say high quality companies, I mean companies which have low leverage, which have strong balance sheets, which have an established track record and which are long-term winners. And uh, these companies which um, are better than the rest of the market, rest of the sector come at a higher price. So the valuation for our fund, the Aberdeen Latin America Income Fund is 10.8 times for next year's, uh, for next year's PE, which is more expensive than the benchmark at 9.5 times, which has a higher uh, proportion uh, in utilities or telcos, which may not uh, be um, delivering the same kind of capital gains or which may be suffering from regulatory risks. So we don't have uh, exposure to the cheaper parts of the market uh, as much as the index does and more to the quality parts of the market, which is resulting in this high evaluation. Um, but what is encouraging is that um, the debt to equity ratio, which we measure as a, which we take as a measure of quality is much stronger than the benchmark. The ROE is slightly below because we are investing in businesses which are investing for growth. So the Mercado Libres of this world, which are investing for growth. Um, and you know they are investing for higher profitability in future. Uh, we are supportive of that. And as long as we see those businesses um, making progress in terms of their profitability, we're happy to support them and to own them. Uh, typically this number would be higher, but, um, but at this point in time, which is data until January, it shows uh, to be lower than the benchmark. Now I would pass back to Victor to start off uh, with ESG before I come back with some more examples. Thank you, Mubi. Environmental, social and governance factors play a key role in our investment process. And you wouldn't be surprised to see that that leads us to higher quality ESG portfolio than the benchmark. Uh, in fact, by concentrating on these factors, we manage to avoid a lot of the laggards, those companies which have higher material ESG risks. And our portfolio is based in the, the top quartile, according to MSCI. We have a especially strong performance on governance, uh, as you can see on the relative scores. And also we pay attention to the carbon footprint of our portfolio. If you look at the carbon intensity stats uh, on this slide, you can see that we are substantially below the benchmark when it comes to emissions, both direct and indirect. And on the next slide, uh, I would like to share a few thoughts about our ESG investment philosophy, why we are so concerned with ESG, because we do believe that taking into account ESG factors enables us to generate better long-term outcomes for our clients, given that many of these factors are financially material for the companies we invest in. They do impact performance of the corporates. And it's also important to understand that when we talk about ESG, uh, it has both negative risks, 
uh, but also have positives as opportunities uh, to have to find better investments. Uh, and one additional thing is important when you are doing ESG investment is that you try to improve the quality of your portfolio. You're not just looking for the best companies, but you're also trying to make them even better. And this is where engagement comes into play, which is a quite an important part of the ESG process we follow at Aberdeen. Uh, and with that, I would like to give back uh, the mic to Mubi to go through a few examples of engagement. Okay, thank you, Victor. So I'll come back to uh, our companies on the next slide. And I would like to talk about two recent engagements. Um, as Victor mentioned, engagements are a key part of our investment process. And the two examples are chosen here uh, include a healthcare company and then one of our commodity plays. So the first is Intermedica that we talked about uh, uh, previously in the, in the theme uh, aspirations. So the, so the vertically integrated healthcare operator. And here we are engagement of course focused on corporate governance. We are part of the Brazilian chapter of 30% club, which advocates for gender equality on board of directors and asks for 30% representation of female directors. So we have engaged with a number of our holdings uh, in Brazil uh, as part of this club and Intermedica was one of them. This company, as I mentioned, has recently completed a merger so they, this would be a topic that would be addressed by the new board, and we will continue to pursue uh, progress on this topic. But this was an interesting engagement for us um, on corporate governance. Uh, with Ryazan, which is a recent IPO, before we invested in this company, we um, conducted an engagement on um, its supply chain uh, oversight and labor practices uh, in the sugar and ethanol industry. And this is an ongoing engagement. We want to get more and more detail about, about the supply chain audits, but this is an engagement related to the S in ESG. So the point of showing you to the, these two different examples is to show that engagements are um, on topics related to all three E, S, and G. Then moving on to the next slide, I want to talk about two um, recent initiations in the fund. Uh, the first is Pericorp. Uh, one of the leading banks in Peru, um, which is actually uh, in a number of businesses. So it does banking, microfinance, insurance, investment banking. It's also has operations in, in some other countries like Colombia and Bolivia. Um, we own this bank in the portfolio. This is a recent initiation for us. We took example of cheap, uh, the, the advantage of uh, cheap valuation to get into this bank now after monitoring it for a, for a long period of time. Um, Moving on then to the next example, uh, which is a different industry altogether. It's 3R Petroleum. And this is a junior uh, oil and gas company, which is focused on onshore and shallow water production. And what this uh, company is about, it's about assets which have been divested by Petrobras and it's mostly run by Petrobras ex-employees. So people who know the, these assets well, and also because these are mature assets already, uh, they bring cash flow from, from day one, um, which, is, which is good for uh, cash flow generation of the business and for, the pr for production growth within the company. So this is one of our uh, energy holdings within the portfolio. We hold other companies as well, but this is an exciting new one for us. I would now, now take you towards, um, moving towards Outlook, um, but I would just like to highlight why Aberdeen um, has, a, has a special skill set in, Lat in Latin American equities. It has to do with experience. We've been investing in the region uh, since 1980s. And we have um, on the ground presence, we have an office based in Sao Paulo uh, since 2009. Um, on the ground presence helps with uh, not just getting to know our companies better, but also with engagements. Uh, we are part of uh, all the all the big uh, enga engagement groups in Brazil and uh, have led on many important engagements in the Brazilian stock market. Um, we are also, um, because of our investment process, we're focused on uh, the long term, which is important to look at a region like Latin America, where, where there could be uh, cycles related to political events or um, the nature of the nature of the market. Some markets actually can trade in line with commodities at times. So this long term focus really pays off being active, being vocal uh, shareholders um, uh, and, and encouraging our companies to get better as Victor highlighted. 
pays dividends. And that is, um, you know, literally the case in this fund. Uh, if we move on then to the next slide, I would just like to finish off with uh, the point where I started about the uh, region looking very good value at this point in time. And this chart here is showing us the LATAM valuation versus emerging market. Um, and you can see that MSCI LATAM, which is a purple line, is much lower than MSCI EM, the, the blue line, which is indicating the difference in their price to earnings ratio over the next 12 months. So finishing off where we started on uh, coming back to LATAM valuations, I would like to show the discount between Latin American markets and emerging markets on this table here, where you can see in the premium to discount to emerging markets column on the left-hand side chart uh, table, that Latin market is at a 30% discount to the emerging markets index. And if you compare it with its own historical average, it's at a 31% discount. So coming back to the point that this is a time to get back into the region, um, uh, when valuations are still cheap and the companies are poised for earnings growth, um, it becomes even more visible when you look at some of these uh, discounts uh, which are available uh, even today. Uh, on that note, I would like to end this presentation and uh, thank you all for your time. That's great. Thanks. Thank you both very much for your time today. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, presentation on the region that's perhaps a, a bit un underappreciated by investors. Uh, no if problem. you'd like to tune in to uh, some of our other videos on the quoteddata.com website, you'll be here, able to hear from other managers who were part of our panels for our Around the World webinar series. Thank you. <laughs>